Great. Thank you. So it, it's such a delight to actually have Sandra as part of uh, this brief attention to biological diversity in this program, uh, because she has done such extraordinary things on behalf of life on Earth. So when you add up the incredible variety of life on Earth, which collectively we call biodiversity, all those species add up to a living fabric. We tend to think of them individually to the extent we think of them at all, but taken together, they drive great global cycles of carbon and nitrogen, for example. To take one, the carbon cycle and climate change is an incredibly important one. Climate change is really a biological problem. Burning fossil fuels is releasing the energy of ancient photosynthesis in a geological instant. And in addition, we have destroyed so much terrestrial nature that there is as much carbon from destroyed nature in the atmosphere as survives in current ecosystems. A good ending, ending to climate change will require bringing a significant portion of that back through ecosystem restoration. We exist on a living planet, which works as a linked biological and physical system. system. For a satisfactory outcome, that means actually we need to manage ourselves. Indeed, Tom, uh, people often ask me, how do I read the biodiversity crisis as compared to the climate change crisis and the poverty and inequality crisis? And I think people make this question because they see biodiversity as the animals and plants out there are quite separate from us. But science tells us that living nature is much more than an inventory of species. The living nature is, as you say, the fabric of life, the living fabric of the planet, the intricate tapestry in which all the living, including us humans, are intergoven. And this living fabric is essential to the functioning of the planet and to human well-being. Unfortunately, we have now incontestable evidence that the living fabric of the earth is being unraveled fast. And the ultimate reason why this is happening is the present dominant model of appropriating nature, doing business, and relating to each other. So, runaway climate change, massive biodiversity loss, and intolerable social and environmental inequalities among people are simply the three most serious symptoms of the same root problem. Therefore, there cannot be an appropriate solution for these three existential challenges without tackling them together in a coordinated way and without realizing that the living fabric of the earth is at the core of the three challenges. Thank you, Sandra. Um... So I have had the joy of working in the Amazon rainforests since 1965 on science, but also trying to protect it. One of the fascinating things shown in the current slide uh, was discovered in the 1970s that the Amazon makes half of its own rainfall in a major cycle that provides moisture to every country in South America except Argentina. Weather moves east to west across the Amazon, and the rain that falls evaporates off the complex surfaces, and in addition is transpired through the leaves. It recycles more than six times, crossing the basin. We are now at a tipping point 
where there will be insufficient rainfall to support rainforests in the southern and eastern Amazon, and it will convert to savanna vegetation with multiple consequences, including less moisture for central Brazilian agriculture. It would lead to massive biodiversity loss, serious impacts for the people now living there. Deforestation has to stop right away and, and be accompanied by reforestation to build back a margin of safety. In other words, to back away from the tipping point. If we take care of Amazon biodiversity, it will take care of us. I, I think this is a brilliant illustration of a distant connection, what we like to call a telecoupling, a distant connection between ecosystems far apart from each other. And the world is indeed full of these natural telecouplings. And we want to make sure we don't disrupt them because once disrupted, we don't have much of a clue how to restart them. Now, I would love to add a second image, if I can have the second slide, which complements your point, Tom, and also is directly relevant to the main theme of this conversation, which is the local versus the global. This is a map, it's a global map of human-made teleconnections. This is just air traffic before the pandemics. It doesn't include other really important teleconnections such as shipping lanes or roads. What this image illustrates is that we have drastically exacerbated telecoupling with our global exchanges of goods, uh, waste, information, organisms and people. And all these global exchanges deeply involve the living fabric of the earth, either because they take materials from it or they dump waste on, on, into it or because the transport itself is through the bodies of living organisms all the way from microbes to traded plants and animals to people constantly traveling between regions and continents. This is why I think today nobody on earth is fully local. Because of these global connections, we are never fully local. In two senses. First, because we are all the time receiving influences originated in processes at very distant places. And second, because what we choose to eat, buy, burn, support or ignore every day has impacts. It has impacts on remote ecosystems and on remote peoples, despite the fact that we will probably never see them in person. That is why I think that the classic slogan, uh, think globally, act locally, has become a bit outdated. We do need to think locally as well as globally, and we do need to act globally, or at least as broadly as we can, as well as locally. Looking after our beautiful backyard tree and compost heap, is of course a nice thing to do, but it's definitely going to fall way, way short. We do need collective action and we do need coordination. Thank you for that great presentation of, of telecouplings. Uh, no better measure of our impact on the world. We also need to appreciate that every species, plant, animal, or microbe, represents a close to 4 billion year evolutionary lineage, which in itself should be respected. All these species constitute a gigantic library of the life sciences. Each one represents a set of solutions to a set of biological challenges and opportunities. 
And any one of those has the potential to transform the life, science, the life sciences, like the vaccinia virus led to vaccination, or the fear to loss led to ACE inhibitors, which hundreds of millions of people take for high blood pressure. Driving species to extinction is like book burning, total folly. We should revel in the variety of life on Earth. And of course, collectively, they provide ecosystem services like soil fertility, protection of coasts from storm surge, or watershed functions uh, like pollination. Insects in New York State provide trillions of pollinations to fruit trees every year. These need to be treated as assets and kept track of in national accounts. Yes, uh, we know now that most of the vital contributions of nature to people have been declining worldwide over the past 50 years. And we also know there's no satisfactory substitute for most of them. So we simply cannot keep going like this. And in this, we maybe we need to keep in mind three facts. First, most vast majority of people actually enjoy a, a, a thriving connection with the rest of the living. Second, the living fabric of Earth can be kept in place, is physically feasible. And not only that, if we look at the numbers, it's also affordable, much more affordable than the cost of inaction. So I would say, let's not allow our common future be stolen for us. Let's defend our future. Let's fight for it. Let's create it. And in moving towards this better future, we once again stumble across the question of the global versus the local. I personally think that we need to act urgently in the shape of practical measures locally at the points in which the physical impact is felt. But that is not enough. We also need to make fundamental changes at another level, at the level of the social, economic, governance and institutional factors, at the level of the social narratives we keep telling each other about what a good life entails, because it is all these factors that are the root causes, the underlying, the underlying propellers of all the physical impacts we see worldwide. Of course, they are much more difficult to tackle, but it's indispensable towards this vision of a better future for all. And let me tell you, Tom, that uh, is for me a great privilege to have shared this space with you. You are the mentor of all of us working on biodiversity. Wow. Delight to do it with you, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs>